Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Steyer. I'm the founder and CEO of Common Sense Media, and welcome to another Common Sense Conversation. And this one is going to be a pretty awesome one. We have two incredible guests and partners in this um, session. Kids' well-being. Uh, and again, I'm Jim Steyer, uh, but more importantly, I get to introduce two terrific guests. First of all, uh, one of our uh, discussions today is my good friend, Jennifer Siebel Newsom. She's the first partner of California, um, and she's much more than that. Um, she's a great friend of mine and of Common Sense Media for many years. Uh, she wrote and directed three extraordinary documentaries, Misrepresentation, The Mask You Live In, and Great, Ameri and Great American Lie, um, which I will have to urge everyone who's watching today to go and rent and watch because they're fabulous. She's not only an incredibly talented filmmaker, but she also then built the representation project into one of the leading voices in the country on issues related to uh, gender and, and proper cultural representation in uh, the media industry. She just recently contributed a major essay to Common Sense's report about tweens, teens, tech, and mental health. And I think most of all, she is the incredible mom of four kids. So Jen, it's amazing to have you here today. Um, and thank you for joining us. Bless you. Thank you. And the, our other, our, it's gonna be so fun to have, to have this discussion. And our other uh, colleague is Lisa Ling, a nationally respected journalist and leader on exactly the same type of topics uh, that, that Jen and I are, are so interested in. I told Lisa before the show, I first met her when she was on channel one with Anderson <laughs> Cooper when she was a teenager and she has had an extraordinary career in journalism. She's currently the host of This Is Life uh, on CNN. Um, she uh, previously was host of The View and has done an extraordinary, has had a great career in journalism. And like Jen, she is a doting mother and a big common sense friend and fan. So I will turn it over to my friend Lisa Ling for hopefully a great discussion. Thanks so much to both of you. Jim, thank you so much. First of all, it's it's such an honor to be moderating uh, this conversation with the two of you. Jim, you've been a tireless advocate for our children for so long, uh, especially at this time when uh, they and we are just inundated and overwhelmed by unlimited amounts of what seems like uh, so often unfiltered information. And Jen, I just don't have the words to uh, to, to to describe how incredible you are. You are um, indefatigable uh, in your advocacy uh, on so many issues that elevate the lives of so many people. And, and we are just so lucky to have you as first partner of the state of California. Um, to all of you who are watching, uh, who've logged in, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Both Jen and Jim know that even before the pandemic, this issue of technology's impact on our kids' brains and mental health has been hugely important to me. I produced a number of shows for my show, This Is Life, on this very issue. And what a lot of people I don't think realize is that these devices that we carry around with us, that our kids are, are, are constantly attached to, they're supercomputers. Um, they're not just phones, they're supercomputers um, and that, that, that process information so quickly, so fast that it's even difficult for our adult brains to handle. And our kids, their brains are in this incredible stage of development from birth to 17 years old. And, and I can tell even from the behavior of my own young kids, they're seven and four, um, that, that when they are using devices, they are just sort of consumed and, and exhibit these kind of addictive behaviors themselves. <laughs> and so I've just been on this crusade to really figure out how we can use technology um, in a much safer way. And, and today I'm hoping to get some help um, and advice from, from this panel. And, and, and if you all have questions or insights you wanna share, please do so. Um, so I'm going to start off first of all, uh, Jim and Jen, uh, we are in the midst of this unprecedented pandemic. Um, how are your families dealing with this and, and how has distance learning been for your kids? And, and if we're being honest here, how often are they on screens? Jen, I'll start with you. That's great. Um, big question. Thank you so much, Lisa. 
again for doing this with Jim and I. You are an incredible, incredible journal journalist and an incredible advocate, and we are so lucky to have you. Uh, well, this has been, you know, these are unprecedented times for all of us. Um, I have a four-year-old, a just turned seven, just turned nine, and a 10-year-old. I have two kids with learning differences. Um, we, we have a home with, you know, great Wi-Fi access. We have computers, even if one of the kids was on my own home laptop. So, you know, we have a backyard for them to run around in. So no complaints in terms of distance learning. I, I feel very fortunate in that regard. But it, but the, you know, distance learning with two kids with learning differences and a four-year-old um, is a struggle, as we know, especially when mom has multiple jobs and one of them being a volunteer job as first partner um, and a responsibility, um, you know, as, as um, someone who's trying to, you know, help California get through this time. Um, my kids were exposed to media really for the first time in ways that um, were very overwhelming. And so what I've tried to do through the California Partners Project is really um, share best practices and tips with families that I was also learning myself because I found that the floodgates just opened. I came home one day and my kids had discovered something online that wasn't age appropriate, um, was mixed messaging, wasn't factual. And we started to have these conversations with at the time six and eight and 10 year olds and the four year old, you know, was literally plastered to, you know, the iPad and it was not healthy. And it was, um, you know, you know, we 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 all know where we ourselves as as adults are experiencing this physical, emotional, and mental health crisis um, that has a result of this pandemic, and our children are too. Uh, so, you know, we've had to have a lot of conversations. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of sadness, as my husband publicly shared. One of our children was just in tears, hid under the bed because she missed her friends so much. I mean, there, every day is a battle. Um, and I like to think that my children are really good, sweet children, but they're struggling. Um, even with all of the good fortune that we have, they are struggling. Um, and, you know, one of the things too is that they're getting news through social media, which again, they were not exposed to before. Uh, one, one of my children has spent a lot of time on TikTok on a private account that's bounced back and forth between private and public. And we've had some issues there. Um, but but what I love is she's creative and she's dancing and she's learning all about dances. And I love that part. And that's the beauty. The downside, though, is she she is exposed to the news and she's in that age. They say sort of those middle school years where you you have to you don't want to expose your kids to everything because it's too much for their little brains, for where they are socially and emotionally. And so we're having to have conversations about things that um I wasn't exposed to at that age. So, and I know that all of you are as well. So again, I guess in a long <laughs> um, winded way of saying, you know, there has been more exposure to violent video games, which I've seen a lot more aggression in my son and I'm not comfortable with it. Um, a lot of that addiction, addiction like uh, behavior, which we know the World Health Organization um, is well aware of and um, does not advise young boys uh, especially in these early years where their imaginations are just um, leading them, guiding them um, to be exposed to all of this violent media. And then we've seen the sort of hypersexualization and self-objectification that our young girls are exposed to and that addictive tendency to want to be on the device. And again, the upside being that they get to communicate with their peers or play games with their peers. The downside um, of that being that they're being pulled um, in a way that they're not fully conscious of, of um, the, the mechanisms that went into creating these social media platforms to addict them and to continue to kind of pull them in. And so there is some harm in that. So anyway, I look forward to talking to you um, about this because I know, uh, Jim, you've done a lot of research and Lisa, you've done a lot of research as well. And so, um, you know, I, I think we're all doing the best we can. Um, again, these are very challenging times for everyone, no matter your, um, aside from, and I didn't mention this and I should mention the digital divide. That's a whole other issue I'd love to talk to you about, but obviously that's a big issue for a lot of families as well. 
Jim, tell us how, how you've been dealing with, with the pandemic and, and, and screens in your own home with kids. You know, it's tough. So we've had common sense for 17 years and we always say, you know, we have had these incredibly important rules that we've probably been the national, if not global leader on setting screen time rules. And a lot of them just went out the window with COVID-19. And as Jen said, as a parent, it's really a challenge. Now, three of our kids are older and college are out. So they're pretty much on their own. They don't really listen to their mom and dad too much anymore. Uh, except when they need money. Um, but our 16 year old um, is really struggling, I would say, he, uh, because a couple of things. One, he's doing all of his classes. On, and again, like Jen, I'm sure like you, Lisa, we're incredibly blessed and privileged. We have very good Wi Fi. The kids are able to get outside and run around, which is not true for so many kids here in California and around the United States uh, today. But it's really tough, I think, for our 16 year old. He just started junior year in high school yesterday. Um, he has to take all of his classes online. He doesn't get to see his friends as much. So there's all the social emotional challenges there. Um, Jen, he is a video game. He would play video games for 24 hours a day if we let him. Some of them are violent. We've been on that crusade at Common Sense for probably more than a decade. Um, and you know, th this is an arms race for attention uh, in general, the digital age and digital era has been. But during COVID-19, it's just so much more complicated because the primary way that we're communicating with people is on screen. So many of the traditional norms and rules are out the window and you've had to modify them as a parent, as educators, et cetera. So these are really, really challenging times. Um, and I'm sure every parent in the audience is experiencing that and we're just doing our best. And yes, Jen's totally right. We should also talk about the digital divide and all the facts that the kids who are suffering the most are clearly the kids in the lowest income neighborhoods who have the least adva advantages to start out with and where learning loss is more substantial and where this pandemic is just devastating to normal everyday life. And it's okay not to be okay. That's the one thing we say to all of our hundreds of employees at Common Sense and we would say everybody in the audience is, it's okay not to be okay because these are really tough times. Yeah, I want to sort of throw some some scenarios at you. I mean, we 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 are there, there's so much on our plates as parents right now. Um, most kids in this country have experienced some form of distance learning. Many of them are going to be going back to school exclusively via distance learning, um, and so they have to be on their devices for a certain period of time. Right. We as parents. We've got so much going on. If we if we hope to be able to do a little bit of work uh, to to just even organize what's going on in our lives and our houses, um, it's 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 often just so much easier to just give our kids the device because we know that it is going to offer them enough distraction, right? Or they they will be able to, um, uh, I guess, focus on what they're watching for seemingly extended periods of time. So in those kinds of circumstances, and again, we've never really experienced anything quite like this, what can we do to, um, to, 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 to keep their, to, to get them out, for example? I mean, I know my kids, given the choice between being on their device, going outside, interacting with family members who even in a socially distant way, it's not as appealing as being on this device. In fact, nothing compares to the kind of stimulation they can have on their devices. And 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 Jim, much of this is is, is by design. I mean, the, the technology right. companies they they know explicitly how to almost lure us all in and 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 keep us on our devices right. for extended periods of time. Can you give the people who are watching just a sense of of, of, I don't want to use the word duplicitous, but they know um, th 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 this is sort of an intentional effort to get people to, to, to remain on their devices. No question. I mean, no question. The simplest thing I would just think of is autoplay. So, you know, three, two, one, and the next episode comes on. So you were planning to watch one 30 minute episode on Netflix or Amazon or whatever streaming service you're on. And then three hours later, you've watched six in a row because autoplay, autoplay. That is an intentional design. So as we've done this work over the past few years, as we focused on addiction, attention, distraction issues aimed at kids, aimed at teens, it's clear that the tech companies have built in 
intentional design to keep you addicted and keep you on the platform because that's how they make money. And this is at the end of the game of business. You should see that during the pandemic, the companies that have done the best from a, from a financial standpoint and a stock price standpoint are all big tech players, the social media platforms and others. So there's no question there's intentional design. It is, I don't do, it's, it's absolutely intentional. It is duplicitous. It's not in the best interest of our kids' well-being. And so you have to intervene as a parent. And I think one of the things we've done, so we built this large platform called Wide Open School, which is now uh, it built by Common Sense, but it's now sort of the de facto online portal for family engagement in, in communities and homes around the United States and increasingly globally. We just built it in the last three months. We have a daily schedule. A lot of the daily schedule is about turn off the device and go outside with your kids or play some games with your kids or make them read a book as opposed to something on the screen. So I think you have to be intentional about creating breaks because you're right, Lisa, whether it's a seven-year-old or my, God forbid, a 16-year-old like our son, Jesse, it's a very big challenge to get them to walk away from the device. Our son would sit and in his room on his phone or computer screen for 12 hours a day if we didn't basically drag him out of there um, and I do think you have to be intentional about it. The challenge, as we all know, is these are such difficult times to be working. People are working at home or they've lost their jobs. So I think it is one where we all have to rally around, but be very clear about scheduling breaks with kids and then having an ongoing conversation with them about the downsides of being in front of a screen for most of your day. Jen, any thoughts on on? Um, what parents can be doing right now to um, to get their kids off their devices and 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 go do some exercise, or as Jim said, read yeah. a book. Any 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 advice you can yeah. give to people? No, I mean I th I think we're all being given the opportunity um, that um, to to teach our kids like what a healthy life looks like. Yeah. Uh, I I love Open Wide School. I there are a ton of resources there. There are a ton of resources online for kids with learning differences, like a few of mine have. Um, so there are these incredible educational um, tools and resources online. I'm a big proponent of there's no media until you've had your breakfast, done your chores, and our chores are extensive. It's not just making your bed and cleaning your room and putting the dishes away. It's walking the dogs, it's feeding the chickens and ducks, it's making sure the rabbit has food. I mean, we sort of have a little mini animal farm as a result of this pandemic. Um, but it, it, it is about putting responsibility on their plate. And then I'm constantly talking about, hey guys, for the rest of your life, you're gonna have to move your body. So you may not have sports teams right now, but you have to do something physical every day. I don't care if it's 30 minutes or an hour, but you have to do something physical. It could be dancing inside, which is why I've allowed and enabled some of the TikTok dancing, but it, it, it could also be a hike or going down to the river, which we're fortunate we live in a very natural setting. And so we have a lot of exposure to the outdoors. Um, the, the one thing though, is they have to earn their media time. And, and I, I know that, common sense to everyone, but they have to earn it and there have to be limits. I, I really am a firm believer one hour is plenty. Beyond that, I get an aggressive, angry, you know, distracted or spacey child. I also, on the boy side, on the girl yeah. side, I get some of that, but I also get a little more of that self-objectification. And that is prevalent in our culture. It is not helping our girls. It's the backlash, right, to women's progress and women standing in powers of leadership and, and in, um, in positions of power. So, you know, I, again, it's a balance. It's the same thing I say to young girls um, when I'm talking about um, self-esteem issues and confidence issues and living a good life. It's like you have a pie. How much, there are all these slices of the pie, and how much time do you spend on your appearance? How much time do you spend on relationships? How much time do you spend doing chores? How much time do you spend learning? Um, and so I like to just remind younger generations that like it's about balance and like, you know, planning your day out in a way. Um, two little fun things that I've actually enjoyed um, watching, observing, I need to get a little more involved in um, personally is my eldest is very entrepreneurial and she's starting a little business. And I, I share that because it's not really a business, but it's, she's made slime, like a lot of kids have on and young women have on social media. And actually some of these girls are really entrepreneurial and successful, 
But I, I love that creative entrepreneurial spirit. And I like channeling it into a little activity, a little endeavor where she can learn about money and she can learn about savings and expenses and budgeting. And, um, you know, and she's very determined to sell her slime and, um, you know, marketing and the whole thing. And so I guess I'm trying to say that I would recommend to folks to, to just themselves muster up any energy you have to think outside of the box and, um, you know, take that that creative energy that your kid might have right now and turn it into something that maybe relies a little bit on media because you're marketing and selling online, but that really, um, you know, just builds confidence and gets them to, to obsess about something uh, that actually might be productive, that actually might benefit them in the long run. Well, Jen, you mentioned uh, the, the, the gender piece and Common Sense has a new report called Tweens, Teens and Tech. And it Correct. found that girls, particularly those who, who may be somewhat self-conscious, and, and, and really when you think about it, that probably applies to all of us, um, mm -hmm. but they are more at risk for mental health issues. Um, I, I wanna talk about that because you know, as, as an adult, uh, when I see friends get together and you know, they, don't, they don't call me <laughs> uh, because everybody posts you know, every aspect of their lives, yeah. I have to admit, I feel a little left out and I'm, a, a, you know, a middle aged woman with kids. I just I constantly think about how that makes kids feel when they see people, you know, their fellow fellow yeah. uh, students and friends posting things that they're not a part of. I mean, to me, it's every the worst aspects of high school magnified yep. um, and, and even in this COVID era of COVID, there are still interactions kids are having together where they are able to leave people out. I mean, cancel culture is a perfect Correct. example of that. So, so Jim, can you talk about the report and, and, and um, offer some ways to help parents who are, who have kids who are navigating these emotional issues? Sure. And Jen, Jen knows a ton about this too. And, and she does, and she has a great piece in the report. I mean, the comparison factor is just so huge. By the way, we've been Ben and I have been talking about this since I wrote Talking Back to Facebook in 2012. And the biggest thing I saw then, which is even magnified today in general and during COVID-19 in particular, is that girls in particular, in that in those times, 50% of girls uh, who were tweens and teens were photoshopping their images on platforms like Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook, et cetera, where they were displaying themselves. So they were photo photoshopping their images so they could look prettier or thinner or whatever. So that you could the the mental health implications of that comparison culture were have been incredible for a decade. And they're just magnified at a time when kids were in front of screens more. And then you're absolutely right, Lisa, what you see is the cancel culture stuff can magnify this. I think also just People post, people post idealized versions of their lives. It's not their real life. Again, one, one of the many reasons why Jen's suggestions about being very clear about setting limits as much as you can and getting your kids away from screens and not just living your life entirely on, on a screen is so important because it is a comparative culture, particularly on social media platforms like Instagram or, or uh, Snapchat, or if they're, which are where the, the primary places that kids are hanging out today. Um, and I think it's just incredibly important to have an ongoing conversation with their kids, girls and boys about that, including some of the tough body image stuff. The, the only other thing I would add is this, for every parent out there who's feeling this is so hard, it's really hard for everybody. We're all going through this and there's no perfect parenting. So it's not as if some of us are just perfect at this and getting it all right. It's really hard. And the mental health issues for kids are extraordinary. You can see them in this report. We should make it available to everybody who's watching today. But the other thing is there's mental health issues for adults. This is a really hard time for adults in addition to kids. And I think it's okay to say that. And it's really hard time to be a parent. And so these are unprecedented times. And I think the more we can talk with our, each other and with our kids and also cut ourselves a break. I do think one of the things you have to do is cut yourself a, and your children a break because We've none of us have ever gone through anything like this period in our right. lives. There's never been a period like this. And we know how hard it is for us. So imagine Montana. That's Jennifer's kid who I remember when she was born. My God. <laughs> um, but um, or for Jesse, our 16 year old, this is I look at him. He is not having fun a lot of the time. 
and he misses his friends. He misses his basketball games. He misses all these things. So I think we have to be careful to not be too harsh on kids yet if, and ask them good questions. Ask them about what they're feeling. I mean, Jen, Lisa, you should comment too. You've got a seven and a four year old. It's not that easy. What do you think, Jen? Well, I mean, it's a great time to your point to talk about family values and to really kind of slow down. I think we were spinning and, and sprinting at such a rapid pace, I mean, across this country, right? Um, I, I, in some ways, I think our society was a bit out of control. And so there have been some gifts, right? And slowing down, obviously not gifts if you're an essential worker and you're on the front lines every day. So I want to clarify that. But for those that have had the opportunity um, to be home with their children and be present with their children and actually engage and have these conversations. You know, I remember prior to the pandemic, you know, my kids were playing basketball at 7 and 8 p.m. at night. And I love basketball and I was coaching one of them, but it was crazy. I was like, this is ridiculous. When have we had a family meal? And so there are some gifts that I think we want to grab onto and hold on to and keep beyond this, you know, when we're out of the COVID-19 um, era. And, um, you know, so so that's one thing. I mean, I could say a lot of things. With regards to, to Lisa, the comparison culture, again, perpetuated by media. I mean, I'll just share this morning. I had a little battle with our son about um, him wanting to use spend ten dollars on some outfit outfit his character in the video game because it's like a game he plays with his friends and i was like no ten dollars a lot of money that took you a lot of time to earn that ten dollars that ten dollars needs to be split into savings and charity and then spending that's not ten dollars that you have there buddy so it's exhausting he's driving me crazy but i'm having to just take a deep breath and say okay i got this i'm in charge he needs to learn that he can't have immediate gratification all the time. He has to earn things. The media culture wants him to want, 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 want. I mean, some right. of the conversations that my kids, we've had at the dinner table, the things that they're exposed to. Last night, we were talking about Kim Kardashian and her likes and this and that. I was like, and because my husband knows her, I was like, no, that is not my role. That is not the role model. That is not the person that I'm raising you to be. Entrepreneurial, yes. But in the other departments, no. And don't look her up on social media. So <laughs> I, I just like these are, you know, we are being so much is being thrown at us. And so I'm just, you know, every day, every night I go to bed as it gets later, I'm a little grumpier, but I have to remind myself, like, there's some good things coming out of this. And I have to focus on those with my family because they're opportunities, they're life lessons. Um, and if I can sort of correct things right now, then I, I'm going to. Here's one thing I do want to share that I, 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 I would be remiss if I didn't share this. And, and Lisa, you know about this. Jimmy, you know about this. There's a documentary coming out on Netflix um, early September called The Social Dilemma. It basically exposes the whole uh, manufacturing and construction of these social media platforms to be addictive, to hook you in. And it's fabulous. And you've got to sit down and watch it with your tweens and your teens. And frankly, I want my eight-year or my nine-year-old to watch it because it, they need to understand that in some ways they're being played and that they're being manipulated and that they actually are potentially, you know, could be being used. They're, they're being used, right? Their data is being collected and what have you, but they're really being, their tools, right? For somebody else's financial gain. And it might look like fun, but really they're just being played. And so I, I really cannot wait for you all to watch that because I think if we can educate our kids to take the power back into their own hands and to not be victims uh, to this, you know, massive empire that some of it, which is good, but some of, and a lot of it, which is very harmful to children um, and to adults for that matter, and also which is harmful to our society because it's dividing us uh, with with the perpetuation of lies and, and mistruths. Um, it's gonna be a fabulous thing for you to watch with your family. Jen, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and Jim, we started talking about this a bit earlier uh, uh, about how these social media platforms right. are designed, but even how our, our devices are being designed. It, it is with the intention of getting people to stay on longer. Correct. And this whole business about likes, for example, and, and every every single feature is so well thought out and and, 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 and designed to to addict you. Every color is right. is thought out, every the, the, the way you see them. And 
you know, I, my, my seven-year-old, um, you know, asks sometimes, well, how many people like this? <laughs> and, and again, it's that, 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 that instant gratification that I think is so uh, concerning for, for me as a parent, because uh, this is, this kind of mentality uh, is, is, is so pervasive among young people in so many ways, they feel like they can't even live their lives. If, it, if, if it's not postable, it's That's not right. worth doing. And, and, the, and some of the things that I've seen kids push to do for the sake of the post is, is deeply concerning. And, and Jim, I wonder, is there, um, is there pressure that we can put on the actual tech companies, the social Definitely. media outlets to design products that are not so harmful? I mean, is, that, is it realistic to even think or to ask companies to have a conscience when 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 it could affect their bottom line absolutely and you know lisa honestly common sense is the leading advocacy group in the world now on those issues and we go right at them on these issues um and i'll give you some examples so on the issue of intentional design obviously we know the guys who made this the film that that jen is referring to very well we helped them do the film from the from the get-go so we have had any any number of conversations with the people who run facebook and instagram youtube and google Apple, Netflix, this is at the C CEO level and, and, and just below about the de deleterious impacts of some of these technologies. Very blunt, very, uh, some of the key factors in our points to them have actually been their own employees, engineers from companies like Facebook and Instagram talking about the, like the guy who designed the like button, for example, as part of our team. And so we have gone after the major tech companies on those issues. Second, in the case of Facebook and Instagram in particular, we launched a campaign about a month and a half ago called Stop Hate for Profit, which was about the amplification of hate speech and racism and, and, and misinformation that relates to the uh, 2020 election. But we were going after them uh, for years, uh, ever really since I wrote Talking Back to Facebook about some of the flat, what they do on their platforms. We've taken, we have gone on any number of occasions to read Hastings and the folks who run Netflix about some of the um, some of both the design features like autoplay, but also some of the content on the platform and tried to be, hold them publicly accountable for that. So do I believe pressure works? Absolutely. And I will tell you that there's, but assuming a positive election result in 2020, you're going to have a new set of regulations, I think at the federal level in 2021 around some of the, the, the platform liability. But the other thing I would tell you is, we passed, we wrote and passed, and Jen's husband, who happened to be a good friend of ours and we're big fans of, uh, was very supportive of this. We passed the uh, uh, California Privacy Act, uh, CCPA, in 2018, which is the first major national privacy law in the United States, which was really started about protecting kids' privacy online. And now it reflects all consumers' privacy. So the answer is we absolutely feel an obligation at Common Sense to lead the way on holding the tech companies accountable. And you have to go at them as parents because they can't just look at this as a bottom line issue. These are cultural societal issues. And so at the end of the day, that kind of advocacy matters. It matters when Jen, the first partner of California speaks up. It matters when her husband Gavin speaks up on these issues. Lisa, it matters when you do shows on this is life on, on these issues because they're so important to make the public aware and basically shame works. I feel very strongly that, and Jen has been extraordinary with the representation practice. She's not just a great filmmaker and mom, but she's also a really great advocate and colleague of ours. And I think you have to shame some of the people running the companies because they have their parents too. And it's mm -hmm. simply not okay to say, oh, I'm gonna have my kids go to a Montessori school and never be allowed to have devices, but I'm gonna hook everybody else's kids because I can make more money. So yes, I think the advocacy side of this is critical. We lead the way in the US and global land these issues and everyone who's watching should join us and they should partner with Jen too, who's there's no more outspoken public figure than Jennifer Siebel Newsom about these issues way before she became the first partner of California. But yes, we have to go directly at the leaders. And I think Stop Hate for Profit's an example of where we went at their wall. We hit them in the wallet because we got advertisers, we got 1,100 companies to boycott advertising on Facebook and Instagram for a month because we were so upset with the amplification of hate speech and racism. That's an example, and you're gonna see more from Common Sense and our colleagues on that kind of, on that kind of thing, because 
the issues are just too important for all of us and for our kids in particular. Yeah. Jim, can you talk about some of the ways in which you are are pushing against the companies and, 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 yeah. and demanding change? Well, it's both. I'd say it's carrot and stick. So for example, on, on Wide Open School, most of the major players, Google, um, Apple, Salesforce, any number of the major tech players became partners from the get-go. YouTube became partners in providing content for kids and families and schools around the, and around the United States and now globally. So on the one hand, we go to them and say, because right now with distance learning, for example, Google is by far the most important company in education. They dominate the education market. If we had a teacher on this, I am a teacher at Stanford, but I'm not a teacher at a K through 12 elementary school anymore. But kids, uh, teachers now rely on Google Classroom. That's how they actually distribute lessons in a distance learning environment. So we went to them plus Zoom and said, you guys have to participate in wide open school. And, and they did. And that's a positive use of their resources. The other stuff we do is we, we do advocacy campaigns, public advocacy campaigns against them like we did to Stop Paid for Profit, where we literally asked advertisers, and you're going to see we're about to come out with a, a new generation of this next week, where we're going to ask people uh, to look at what's going on on Instagram and other platforms. So I actually think you have to take it directly to them, and you have to make it simple and easy for the public to join in or for influential members of the public to join in. And I, I just think the stakes are too high. And the one thing that COVID-19 has revealed, by the way, is that we have an unfair society. If, if, if COVID-19 has done nothing else, it has ripped off the, the, the veneer of that we're, we have an equal society. We have two Americas, we have two Californias. And Jen knows that and her husband knows that. And Lisa, we all know that. And the trouble is the essential workers who are literally keeping our families alive and doing the incredibly hard and getting sick in the process, by the way, mm -hmm. they're leaving their kids at home in schools that in, there are 16 million kids right now in the United States, over well over a million and a half in California, who do not have the technology and connectivity they need for proper distance learning. That's not true in the Steyer family or the Newsom family or your family, Lisa, but it is for... 30, 40% of the kids in the state of California. So we also have to focus on digital divide and making sure even though we wanna limit the use of screens, every kid has to have the ability in a distance learning environment to be able to go to school that way. So it's a fine line and you actually need the companies to support that on the one hand, and then you also have to pound away at them publicly when they abuse their power and when they design products and platforms that are not in the best interest of kids. So it's an interesting balancing act. And we try to do it both. is it, it is certainly an interesting intersection between wanting companies to have some accountability and and trying to figure out ways that that kids can use technology in a safer way but also trying to ensure that people who don't have access are able to act to, to get access i mean the reality is that we need technology i mean That's covid right. has 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 proven that we are absolutely reliant on on technology, and it's incredible that we are able to even uh, maintain our kids' education, and they they can stay in contact even with their teachers uh, digitally. But at the same time, um, unfiltered, unfettered access to technology. I mean, we we can't deny the kind of impact it's having on our kids' well-being and how it's affecting their mental health. Because as Jen said, they're starting to see things. Um, that that they're probably not prepared to to see, and, and certainly parents aren't prepared. And in one of our episodes, we featured a a 15 year old girl who was at the top of her class, beautiful young woman uh, who who had you know multiple devices. Her mother uh, was a behavioral health nurse, and so she knew what to look for. And uh, her 15 year old girl, again, popular girl, she 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 took her life so unexpectedly. It shocked her little town. And what happened was uh, the, the the police came and, and and took her devices and they found that she had this whole other life online that her mother was entirely unaware of. Uh, she didn't even know what Tumblr was. And if you looked at this this girl's Tumblr, I mean, it was so dark and 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 she'd been posting things for extended periods of time and so i can't underscore enough the importance of parents also just playing a role in yeah. their kids digital lives Good it's friend. as important if not more important because it's so easy kids 
can operate this technology so much, they're, they're, they're more proficient with this technology than we are. And mm -hmm. they can hide these other lives. And now when they're home and they aren't able to have access and they aren't able to socialize in the ways that they, they normally have been, it's easier than ever to kind of go and, and seek out those elements of the dark web in some cases, or, or even mm -hmm. um, develop an, another identity. And so the importance of, of communicating with their kids and, and, and trying to really understand where they've been online and where they're going and the kinds of things that they're looking into um, is just so, so important. I, I can't understand, underscore that more. Um, yeah. It's time for some questions and we have a, a lot of them rolling on, rolling Please. in. Um, okay. Oh, oh go, go ahead, Jen, before we, we take a question. I just this. Like the Nordic countries, there was a, a, a law that you couldn't advertise to kids 12 and under. Right. I think that in this country, our kids should not be exposed or have access to certain media and technology, period. Their brains, as we know, aren't fully formed until they're in their late 20s. It is too much. So one thing that I heard recently that I'm really excited about because the governor set aside 5.3 billion to support California schools to ensure kids had the devices and the connections that they need and the safe environment in which to either be a part of distance learning or uh, be in the sc school itself. One of my friends shared recently that her public school just sent Chromebook to all the students with only the access to what they needed to actually yeah. learn. So without all the other fluff, like if technology companies could just start there and sell us products, not iPhones with all the junk on it that I don't even want, but sell us products that are minimal, that just allow us to connect with our kids and allow our you know kids to reach us in an emergency and allow our children to learn and be educated and connect to a few peers, not the mass public, then it's a win-win. I just, I, it drives me nuts, <laughs> you know, that they are so short-sighted on money, you know, the, it's, it's all about the dollar and it's all about pillaging and raping and getting as much out as they can, as quick as they can, so that they can go buy their, you know, million, you know, their, their homes and have their, you know, all of their assets. And it, rather than like building something that's sustainable and that will last, that will actually contribute to the betterment of humanity, that will actually contribute to our children's health and well being and their academic learning. So I just, we're so short sighted. It's so quick, you know, you know, quick term, quick, you know, fix, quick money. And we really need to slow things down and think about the long run. And, and it's on technology companies, it should not be on parents. It's on the makers and the manufacturers. Absolutely. They are responsible for the mental health. And I'll just end on this, sorry. Um, from your report, thank you, Jim, uh, that you know I got to be a part of. Thank you for acknowledging that young girls, uh, or, or acknowledging for exposing the fact that young girls ages 10 to 14, suicide rates have skyrocketed since 1999. And in particular, black girls and Lat Latin Latinx girls numbers are in the 12 and a half to 10% range of having attempted suicide in the past month. Like that is not okay. No. We're in the middle of a major, major health crisis and the technology companies have to take some responsibility. I agree. What, what do you think the, the, the government's role should be in, in, in pressing these companies for change? Very clear. You have to have, well, we wrote the California Privacy Act in 2018 and there's a ballot initiative um, to upgrade it slightly, not totally, but slightly on the 2020 California ballot. If you're a California resident, you should vote yes on that. But the big thing is platform accountability. And that what that that has to happen at the federal level, because right now, and we, we should get to questions, but look, there's a law that was passed in 1996 of the Communication Decency Act, which basically gave all the major tech platforms a free pass, and they have not been regulated in 24 years about the content on their platform. And until they're held liable for the content on their platform, this is not going to change. And that's what the government has to do. So we have to rethink the fact that we get, we basically treated them like utilities as opposed to like the biggest broadcasters and publishers in the world, which is what they are. So in the same way that when you're on ABC or CBS, Lisa, you can't say what there are strict standards and practices. Okay. That should also be true about Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook. And it isn't right now, but that should change. And there's a regulatory structure that's going to have to happen. So wait until 20, nothing's going to happen under the current administration federally. And that is going to have to happen federally, although some of it can also happen in the great state of California, thanks to Jen's husband being a really progressive governor on these issues. 
but we need, there's a regulatory, we should have a separate conversation with the three of us just about what we should do from a regulatory standpoint and maybe bring a really thoughtful tech person on and let them respond. Well, you, Jim, you know, when, 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 when tech people hear about regulations, it, 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 it sends shockwaves down their Too bad. spines, right? Too but bad. you're so right. Too bad. You know, as someone Too who bad. works in tele you're right, as someone who works in television, if we want to show, uh, you know, a, 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 some images that even are remotely sexualized, right? We Correct. have to go through Correct. immense rigors to be able to do that. I mean, kids these days, when they're on the devices, they put in a couple of key words and they are bombarded in a right. way that their brains aren't able to handle. So this idea that we shouldn't press for, for more regulatory measures, uh, especially when it comes to kids, is, I think, is, no is lunacy. Yeah. Yep. And so um, there, there, there are some questions from people who are watching, but they're kind of disappearing from my device. So whoever's, whoever's monitoring, uh, okay, I see. Um, I have a question for Jen. It seems like there's an unfair burden on moms to help with distance learning, work from home and take care of, of the home. Any tips for managing this? Yes, well, I'm working on a documentary on this actually called Fair Play based on the New York Times bestseller that Eve Rodsky wrote called Fair Play. And we're trying to get to the root of this, which is really about partnership at home and the mental load that women care carry in our brains 24 seven and offloading that and sharing that with our partner. Um, it works actually across the board in, um, you know, straight and gay couples. It is a, an incredible um, resource. I'm learning it because I'm in a similar boat, um, but women are too are caring too much. And I think COVID really um, exposed uh, the invisible labor that women do, the pressures on women to be the breadwinner and the caregiver. And uh, we as a society have so much work to do in this arena. Obviously, government plays a role in policies like um, family leave and child care and, um, um, you know, maternity leave, the whole thing. And, and then Corporations need to provide flex time, sorry, and 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 childcare and what have you. And then at home, though, really, like what happens at home in your partnership? There has to be more partnership there. It may not be 50-50, but it's got to be more like 60-40 in terms of that daily uh, mental load of you know managing it all. And obviously, every family is different. Uh, but I, I really recommend the book Fair Play by E. Brodsky. And again, I'm working on a documentary that should be out in a year. One of the things as a mom that I try to do, I mean, and my kids are, are a lot younger. It, it, this is much more difficult when kids are older and can really navigate the internet really well. But I try to uh, only allow my kids to watch shows um, and, and, and I try to prevent them from just constantly scrolling because I, I really see that that has an effect on their you know, ability to kind of stay focused, um, and 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 it's um, that that sort of instant gratification piece is eliminated when they are able to kind of watch things that are a bit longer. Um, can you put the questions back up? Okay, so um, we have Brick who asks, folks, for much of the country outside of California, the idea of legislative action as a solution is a bit far off. So, what are practical ideas for living with these problems? Well, by the way, I think legislation is going to happen in 2021. I'm really serious. So that's the one thing I would say. Uh, I, I think depending on the election, there's going to be a sea change in terms of the willingness, I hope and pray, of the federal government to regulate it. But by the way, California basically is the federal government right now when it comes to regulating media and tech. And we should be grateful for the leadership of California in doing that. Um, and common sense is in the forefront of that. So you could write us offline, go to commonsense.org and check out some of that. I think though it's the practical suggestions that Jen and Lisa have said. It is really trying uh, on a personal level to find the right balance with your kids to have ongoing dialogue with them about limits and about, and, and it's, it, I got uh, Jen's example there, or, or at least example of, of just watching shows as opposed to scrolling is really good. Um, but I think uh, that it's, there are very practical things uh, that, that we can all do to stay, it's a daily, it's a tra challenge, but it's a daily involvement in your kids' media and tech lives and setting limits, having ongoing conversations, et cetera. What do you, what do you folks think? But the legislation is gonna come next year. It will, yeah. if, if well, you I do a good job in the election. 
And Jim, you said this in misrepresentation that media used to be a public good and it's yep. been privatized and it's become this, um, you know, major capitalist machine. And again, it's all about the eyeballs and the clicks and the viewership. And, you know, we, when we're watching the debates, we scroll from CNN to MSNBC to, to Fox News. And I'm, I don't mean to be partisan here, but I can't watch Fox News because it's not factual. It's a bunch of lies. So how are we allowed to have what people think is news out there um, continue um, to you know manipulate people's minds as such that they're living in a completely alternative universe? And the same things happen on social media. I mean, if if we can't wake up as a country to how divided we've become over things that are not factual, to the lies that are out there, the mistruths truths that continue that pervade, you know, I, I'm sick of it. Being married to someone in politics, it's wrong. It is wrong. I want the news. I want the facts. I don't want your opinion. Maybe I'll read the opinion section because maybe that's where I want your opinion. But we have to really shake media and technology up. And, you know, we, we, we basically, they taken an incredible they've taken advantage of this incredible opportunity to you know to profit um off of manipulating our minds and putting us into this uh, divisive uh, culture where you're on this team or you're on that team and and that is not the america that our founders envisioned it, it is very dangerous and I think that the technology companies have to take responsibility for being a part of that, just as the media companies do. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do. And so I do think regulation, legislation is something that's going to have to come down the line. Um, on the home front, again, it's um, there's a great campaign, Wait Till 8th. And I was going to say Wait Till like 12th in terms of getting your <laughs> Because I really don't think that they need this technology, you know, this um, technology at their fingertips. I think they need basics to be able to contact their parents in emergency or get from this, you know, park to, you know, th that to home. Uh, so we need to be more creative. And I think the technology companies need to be comprised of folks, parents like us who care about this, who are impacted by uh, the the, the d downside of media and technology. And I think they need to start manufacturing media and technology that is appropriate for our children at their specific age and social emotional level. And I would just say to, to parents out there to really be communicative with your kids about what they're seeing and what they're experiencing yeah. and share with them that uh, that that these tech companies they have a bottom line right yep. they are they they create these platforms specifically um, to addict you so that they can use their discretion and really sort of understand and and I would talk them talk with them about um, we talked about you know girls filtering their images right mm -hmm. that that's not reality that that's not how I mean and 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 even maybe even look at some of these photos that are being posted with your kids say that it's impossible to have skin that 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 flawless or to have a waist that thin but really use that opportunity to open a dialogue with your kids um we don't have a lot of uh, uh, time left but jim that, that the previous question that was asked i mean the, the the person who asked it seemed to kind of give up hope that that there could be meaningful legislation around this piece so how can we as parents, as citizens, um, help that effort to mm -hmm. press for legislation? And how can we as citizens pressure tech companies to become more responsible and to have a conscience in designing these, these products? Well, I would say, and this is gonna be shameless, but first, I mean, well over hundred million of you use common sense for your movie and TV and streaming reviews and everything else. So we're the biggest advocacy group in the United States on these issues by a long shot. Join Common Sense. I mean, join Common Sense Media as a member and and put your voice to work. I mean, when we go and do legislation, whether it's in Sacramento uh, or whether it's in Washington D.C. or other state capitals, we bring uh, we bring the voices of the public with us. So I think you have to get involved. There's a handful of organizations. We are the, I would say, acknowledged leader in this field uh, that pressure the tech companies and also write the legislation. So. For example, uh, there's going to be a slew of legislation. This has been such a weird year legislatively, as Jen and her husband know very well because of COVID-19. But there's going to be a slew of legislation that you could be supportive of uh, in 2021, no question, at the state and federal level. So join Common Sense for that. And we can do a better job of that. 
I think the other thing, but I want to go back. I actually think both of you, because your moms are correct. There is the ongoing dialogue that you can have with your kids about this, but you can also get them, Jen used the word played before. As kids get older, by the time they're 10 or 11, you should explain to them that they're being played by tech companies and that, that these features like autoplay or the constant uh, getting you to come back or streaks on uh, Snapchat are, are designed to get you addicted to stay there. And kids don't like to be played by people. And particularly mm -hmm. as they become teenagers, just mm -hmm. trust me, having had four of them. Um, and so I think getting them involved, and I actually think the voices of kids are gonna matter. So increasingly, I think what we try to do is speak up as this large advocacy group and media tech uh, organization that millions and millions of consumers use. But I think that you can write directly to the tech people and go to them as parents and they will listen. I, I absolutely appealing to them as parents and citizens is key because we're gonna need a fundamental rethinking of these values and these strategies to have the healthy, well-being tech world and media world that your kids deserve and all of our kids deserve. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is such a, a, a unique and unusual time, again, because we, we have to be correct. Uh, so so reliant on technology. But by the same token, it's not unfair to want to protect our kids for that very reason, because they 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 have so much exposure. Um, our time is up. I, I want to thank uh, Jen Siebel Newsom, first partner of California for for her tireless advocacy on this issue and, and so many others. I, I'm just blown away, Jen, by um, how how just how how much energy you have with with three kids and, and your passion that you bring to everything that you stand for is so incredibly admirable. And, and Jim, common sense is like a it, it should be our Bible. <laughs> um, for, for, for any parent, really, because it's just such an extraordinary research, uh, resource. So I thank you all for your time and your dedication to improving the lives of, of our children and also uh, for families. Um, we hope that you will mark your calendars for, the, for next week's conversation with Common Sense, Mirrors and Windows. Uh, it's called Why Kids Need to See Themselves in the ref uh, Reflected in the Media They Watch. And for mental health resources for kids of all ages, check out Common Sense's latest report, Tweens, Teens, Tech, and Mental Health. Just go to commonsense.org. Um, we see a, a, little, um, a, a little bit of it right now on your screen. Um, and if you want to share this session, with other parents and caregivers, you can find it on Common Sense's website as well as their YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it. Um, it, it. It's really just chock full of resources and hit the notification bell to stay informed, which I hope you will do as well. Again, to everyone who are watching, we, we know that this is a, a challenging time, but, but we're all in this together and we all are relying on one another um, during these times. So thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks. Bless you and thank you. Thank you so much. This was so fun. This was great.